sorry. Um, within that report, there were, at that point, five recommendations that were made to the school committee to be passed on to the town. And the, uh, they ranged in price uh, anywhere from about 14 to 15 million dollars for what was called option five, on up to the first option. Uh, that range, I think, ran up to around 30, around 50 million dollars. So what they were really looking at was a uh, major renovation or a complete tear down and rebuilding of the wing school as the oldest of the schools. In looking at that cost, as I say, it was not particularly palatable in an era of declining enrollment and downward pressure from the economy on what's happening with both town budgets and school system budgets. So the option five was the least costly, and it began a process for moving some students. In particular, that first uh, that option was to create a uh, school within the school here at the high school within its own wing. And it would be a seven and eight school within the school. There were a number of us involved in that process who said, look, we understand we're not only educators, many of us are parents, some of us are grandparents. And we wanted to be sure that whatever decisions we made, we would end up with programming enhancements to the benefit of our children. The work is about the kids, as I said. So we wanted to be sure that we've gotten to the right place. So the proposal became, uh, for option five, was to add a STEM Academy to the high school. Now I will tell you, uh, when people say, why STEM? There are many uh, states that have charter schools, magnet schools, often with a theme. You'll find high schools for the performing arts and a variety of things like that. So we started looking at what are the what are the real assets that we find right here in Sandwich? What about our location? What about the resources that surround us? And ultimately, that led us to the conclusion that we should really be pursuing a STEM program, system-wide, K-12, all schools. But if we're bringing seventh and eighth graders here to the high school, let's focus on what we know about early adolescence. I will tell you, as superintendent, I've had the luxury of having been an elementary principal, a middle school principal, and a high school principal. And I find I'm able to really kind of go back to what my knowledge and understanding was of young people that we'd be looking at as seventh and eighth graders and what their needs happen to be. So we feel that the STEM Academy is a very good fit for, um, for this proposal. So we were at option five. Then I came to the school committee not long ago and said I have another option. I'll call it option six. And option six basically is one that moves this along at a faster pace. And I'm going to tell you why the faster pace. Because I am normally one who says, give us the gift of time so we can plan well. But I will also tell you that I have been through this and led this in another district. And I am absolutely confident that we can make this happen and happen incredibly well in a, in a short period of time. I have that confidence because of our faculty, our staff, our administration, and our parents and our students. So I want to talk about that this evening. The thing about this STEM option six, it does not require that we spend money on what I've referred to as the brick and mortar. The brick and mortar does not really impact programming for students. And I began thinking about it, said, you know what, I would rather that the town support giving us the staffing and the program that would result in high quality educational opportunities for all of our students K through 12. Save the money on the brick and mortar. The town has other issues that it needs to deal with when it comes to, to construction of municipal projects. So that's just a little bit of the background. So this group tonight that's been meeting with facilities, long range planning, subcommittee, phase one step. 
So the only thing we're looking at right now is this stem piece somewhere down the road, could be out as far as the next decade. If the enrollment trends continue, there will be a need to look at how we're using the three existing K-8s, and will our population actually get to a point where we do not need to function with that number of buildings. I know for everyone, that will touch some heartstrings. And sometimes people are really connected to buildings, but what we're really talking about here is high quality educational opportunities for all of our students. So the purpose of this meeting, I mentioned to some who came earlier, was to provide feedback information to the committee, which hopefully I'm doing that now. And secondly, to form three subcommittees that reflect the member interest and expertise. We have people on the committee who I know have very strong analytical backgrounds from prior work that they did. Uh, some of them are currently doing that work, some of them are retired, but are willing to help us out rather than spending more money with more consultants when we believe we've got the talent right here in Sandwich to help us uh, in these different areas. So the STEM Academy, again, the emphasis here is a school within a school. And we've been looking at primarily the A-Wing, which I realize some of you may not be familiar with. The last time the group met, which was really just uh, an informal meeting with me as superintendent to say, here's where we are, are you willing to serve? You know, if not, everyone had a chance to drop out. And I'm glad to say they're all here. Um, so, school within the school, looking at the, the A wing. And I began to think about where we are as a community. When I started here over a year ago, people talked to me about issues that they saw and challenges within the schools. And I said, wow, that reminds me of an essential question I asked in my last district, which was, to what extent are we a unified school district, or are we a more a loose confederation of schools that share some common beliefs but then function independent of one another. I also began to reflect back on my many years in education. Uh, I think sometimes my gray hair kind of reveals that. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've worked in a number of high quality school systems. And one of the things I found interesting is that often the demands that are there for parents and families, the focus of attention is the here and now and what's going on with my second grader or third grader. And often, if I tried to talk to those parents in any system I've been in, usually it would be, well, that's interesting, but I'm not real concerned about what's going on at the high school. I'm a long way away from that. And then, interesting enough, years later, some of those same parents, if I talked to them about what's going on in the elementary grades, would say, oh, that's a long time ago for me. I'm just interested in what's going on in the high school. But it really is all about community for all of us. And I'm always saying we need to help our kids understand what it is to be part of the community. How do we commune with each other and take interest in the care needs of our total community? So right now we function with these four schools. And I'm more into like the Venn diagram piece, which su suggests that there is a link here between all of these schools. And what happens with one impacts all the others. What happens with the high school will impact programming down into the K-8s. Some may not think it will, but I'm telling you, it will. And the same thing, what happens in the K-8s impacts what's happening at the high school. Throughout the process that we need to be going through in order to implement a STEM Academy, number one most important thing is going to be communications. So tonight, again, this was meant to be a meeting of the committee. I'm very pleased to welcome parents who heard about this. We welcome you, and I thank you for being here. And again, any questions you have, write them down on those cards that are around. So we're going to talk about the communications aspect. One of the things we realize is that we have various constituencies and various concerns. So with parents, what we've been talking about administratively is being sure that we are providing presentations to parents and to organize those with, the assist, with assistance from the PTA at each school as well as the principals. Because I do know that sometimes, like last spring, I met on this topic of STEM at 
the PTA meetings at all of the schools. However, while the turnout may have been good for a PTA meeting, I don't think any group was greater than 40 people. And I know there's a lot more than 40 parents in any of our schools. So it's how do we get the message out to them? And there's a variety of ways in which we can communicate. I happen to like the direct contact with parents and let people hear about it, ask questions. So we're going to work to find ways that we can set those up. I already mentioned the STEM website, sandwichk12.org. We're going to have a frequently asked questions page there. I have for the committee members only tonight uh, a draft, and it has a watermark that says draft, because it truly is draft. And I quite honestly have it just for the committee members, because I don't really want it out there publicly until we feel that, that it reflects where we are in terms of the questions and the answers. Then we'll put it up there, and we will continue to add to it. We also uh, talked today about doing a community presentation with a panel of experts. So I can really envision uh, a panel presentation, perhaps on the stage at Sandwich High School. And we have connected with so much expertise. It has been so moving for me to have had higher education institutions reach out to us, as well as a lot of research groups, both public and private government entities, reaching out to us saying, bravo for the sandwich. We love what we're hearing. How can we help? So um, we're thinking along those lines. It will help people understand why STEM and what it's really all about. For students, and this is really, for me, uh, my love. Uh, for going a meeting tomorrow with a group of superintendents to go flip hamburgers for the senior, for the senior class, uh, I really find our kids remarkable. And it's what is my passion and keeps me doing what I'm doing. And we will not overlook input from our kids, especially those that would be impacted. If we're talking next year, we're talking sixth and seventh graders, I want to hear from them. What's important to them? What would they like to see happen? How do they want the transition to occur? Are there traditions that have been a part of their K-8 school that we want to be sure that we preserve so that they don't lose that experience? We'll also talk about a facility tour and presentation by various program leaders and also from our uh, Sandwich High School student leaders. For faculty, I know that there will be concerns there. And so we're going to have faculty meetings at each school. We will involve focus groups of faculty members to help with the program planning. For the school committee, uh, I will be doing presentations and updates uh, as they ask me for them, or as I feel I need to give them updates. I just shared with them, it will be on the agenda often. And for the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee, I want to reach out to them. And I told our town administrator, Claude Dunham, that I, I'm more than willing to come to any meetings they would like me to come to, to talk about STEM, how we see it, what we would like um, them to help us with, if they're able to do that. In terms of a STEM timeline, I put this up here because the original uh, recommendation from the consultant had STEM starting in 2016. And at first I thought, well, that's great, because I love that gift of time for planning. And that 2016 date is not based on planning. It was based primarily on planning a significant renovation at about $15 million. And to go through a process with the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, um, and we would do that for a project of that scope because the reimbursement currently is about 46%. So not all of that cost would be worn by the town. The state would help out. That formula uh, is a moving target year to year, depending on uh, the state uh, budget. <coughs> so to have a project go through the various requirements and architectural designing, to get it shovel ready, begin the work, and open the school as a STEM Academy fall of 2016. You're going to find, for me stylistically, I've been doing this a long time, I'm a part of this community. I'm living here in Sandwich. And the way I see it, 
part of what I'm asked to do, and paid to do as superintendent, is to provide information and guidance. It, people don't have to accept it, but I need to provide that. And I tend to do that sometimes by being pretty frank with information. And the reality is, this declining enrollment, which is occurring naturally because of declining birth rates, is also um, being impacted by the fact that parents have other choices. At the orientation for freshmen, I looked out at the freshman parents and students. My first comments to them were, I want to thank you. Because I realize as students and parents, you have other choices. And I thank you for choosing Sandwich High School, your hometown high school, to be the place that you want the best possible education for the next four years. And so for me, as I look at numbers, what moved me to say there's more of a sense of urgency than looking at 2016, the sooner we can do this, the better. We had approximately, the numbers 265 combined eighth graders last year. Currently, the freshman class at Sandwich High School is 178. That number is a real concern to me, to Dr. Morris, to the school committee, and it should be a concern to all parents. That's just being frank, we're not hiding that number. And currently, we're looking at about 273. Now, this, these were last year's October 1 numbers, which are the official federal and state numbers. So we'll see those again uh, as we prepare for October 1. Counts. But that 273, if we continue to lose students at that rate, there is, it will be very, very challenging. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at what I do, but I, I'm not the magician that can pull the rabbit out of the hat. If we can't sustain our programs and have families say, I want my son, my daughter, going to the hometown high school, not out of a sense of feeling obligated, but recognizing that it is a high quality program. Parents are not going to opt for low quality or mediocre. I've been a parent, I'm a grandparent. I don't opt for mediocre. I look for high quality. I try and be reasonable and I try and be careful in terms of getting us where we need to be. But if we continue that kind of loss, it will be very difficult to hold on to our programs, to hold on to staff. And if we start losing staff and programs, that staffing can also impact class sizes. And there will be very tough decisions ahead. So right now, I'm saying is what it is. We have an excellent program set up for this year. Many of you read about the fact that we have the ability, we, we started Chinese, which is one of the 21st century language recommendations because of the prominence of China in terms of our global economy. We brought back an engineering class here to the high school that had been lost some years ago because of budget reductions. You can't erode your high school program. The high school needs to be the flagship of your community. So anyway, we, we decided that we would try, put this on the fast track, and the question I had for my administrators and I said, be honest with me, because if you can't, if you can't do it, tell me. But can we make this happen by September of 2013? And our answer is, we can do it. We are going to need help and support from our parents. We're going to need to get the kids on board. And we're certainly going to need the support of the school committee, the selectmen, the finance committee, if we're going to make this happen. What I wanted people to understand is what we're proposing, support, the staffing, and the program, not the brick and mortar. While we haven't run the complete projections that part of the committee and subcommittee work, what I think it's pretty safe to say we could pull this off for way less than $14, $15 million. End up with a better program, which is ultimately what will hold kids here, not the building. So that's why we are recommending uh, 2013. 
this was really information we shared with the committee, but I shared with the parents too. We talked about an analysis of some of the STEM budget needs that we look at. We need to look at some facility modifications, not renovations, but modifications that tend to be lower cost. Some of it would require licensed plumber, electrician, but we can use local people. Um, we do have to follow a bid process and requirements, but we feel we can make the adjustments where they are necessary. Relocation, moving and setup costs, don't know what those would be, that's part of subcommittee work. Um, even thought of signage, um, I don't think that's a high cost item, but we're trying to think of everything that we would have to consider. Technology, we are recommending one-to-one -one for all students and teachers grades 7, 8, 9, and 12, because we, we added tablet technology for grades 9 and 10, that will march forward with the kids. We would like this entire facility to offer, offer tablet technology. I was sharing today, I was in the car when I was, I was listening to a public radio, an interview with a gentleman. Unfortunately, I came, the interview had already started. I didn't get his name, but he just published a book uh, called The Mobile Wave. And the focus was on tablet technology and how it is revolutionizing the whole way in which we look at computer technology, how it's being used by three-year-olds and 90-year-olds. And it was really quite remarkable. It's on my list of books to buy and read. Um, I'm not getting any residual from recommending it. I don't even know the gentleman, <laughs> but uh, the point is everyone's talking about it. There are emergency services across this country that are, that are becoming paperless by using I, uh, tablet technology. And it's being used in so many different ways. Uh, STEM-related equipment. STEM is very much hands-on. It's what we refer to as inquiry-based. And that has been a term used in science for many years. What we've discovered is we need to use inquiry in every classroom, language arts, social studies, every area. Uh, kids benefit from an inquiry-based approach. It has to do with what some people call it discovery learning. And what all parents know is their kids are highly inquisitive. All kids have a sense of wonder, wonderment about them. They're always wondering about different things, which is a great thing. So with that sense of wonderment and inquiry, we try and move kids' thought processes through our schools, through creative kinds of experiences, hands-on uh, discovery, all of it ending towards a national recommendation that we have kids who are prepared and exit 12th grade with uh, one, what is referred to as innovative thinking skills, because our economy is driven by innovation. And I know some people say, well, when you're talking STEM, not all kids want to be involved in a field that represents science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But the fun is, think about it. It's used in everything, in one way or another. I had the opportunity to meet with one of our local glass artisans, Mike Magyar. Our kids, are, some of our high school students are doing a project with him. And as I stood there and talked to them about the chemistry of glass making and how things fuse and how temperature impacts what it does. It's not about just the artistic mind thinking about shape and color. So it's out there in so many different areas. We'll talk more about that. We need to look at um, any uh, transportation adjustments. Don't know if there will be any, but we don't want to leave any stone unturned. If we want to look at K-12 program enhancements for all students to have to be more hands-on and inquiry-based. Analysis of facility. We know that currently there are 20 classrooms in the A wing. They're used, so we need to relocate those teachers. When I mentioned about faculty concerns, traditionally, in most schools, and probably for most of us in this room, when we were in high school, our high school teachers had their classroom, and it was their room. And they may be taught five periods a day, and then they had their planning period, and they basically sat in the room. And so what we're saying is we want to do more of what colleges and universities do, which is there's a teaching space. 
When you have a class, you're in there teaching. When you're not, you're not there. You're in an office area, and someone else is coming in, into your room to teach. That's how we're able to free up classroom space in that A wing. We also believe that if we create that common office space, the opportunity for collaboration and development of curriculum and instructional practice is huge. Teaching should no longer occur in isolation. People need to be sharing uh, their knowledge and expertise. Uh, relocation of the community school from the A wing, that's something Lance Kennedy, our community school director, is, uh, is working on. We're looking at some different options there. Uh, the creation of, at this point we're saying, creation of two wet labs for science, one on the second floor, which would be, we think at this point, seventh grade, top floor, which would be eighth grade. We would have a wet lab on each floor, as well as an art room located in the uh, A wing that obviously needs a sink. So that's the plumbing work that I mentioned. Relocation of central office. I love being where I am. I love being in the high school. But everyone needs to um, be willing to sacrifice or make adjustments. And so a decision will need to be made. The central office, including the superintendent, remain in the A wing. Where does the central office go someplace else? Where would that be? What are the advantages and disadvantages in terms of different locations? Uh, a moving plan. How do we move seventh and eighth grade teachers and their stuff uh, and do that uh, in a in a way that helps mitigate the cost of that movement. Ancillary considerations, the preschool and spinnaker uh, program, and communication skills program. These are system-wide programs. Two of them happen to be held at the wing school. And in that location, they're currently um, overcrowded. And we know we need to move them next year to some place. But we're moving seventh and eighth grade out we're looking probably at either Oak Ridge or Forestdale as possibilities. It's not carved in stone yet. This is the work that the committees need to look at. What's the best arrangement there? Communication skills is a system-wide program, meaning it, while it's located in Forestdale, it draws students from both the Wing District and the Oak Ridge District. And then if all of this happens, it becomes clear that it would be possible to function without the 1927 building at the Wing School. Um, we know that can happen. What it means needs more analysis. We don't know what is involved in terms of cost saving, if there is any. We do know that you can't just shut off the heat and let the pipe spray it freeze. We need to look at what that involves. We believe we have some talent expertise within the committee to help us look at that. And uh, Alan Halls, our director of facilities, has been doing a great job. And together, we feel we can uh, deal with those projections. <clears throat> facilities will also involve transportation. In terms of a school bus plan, we have to look at traffic flow out here. Where do cars come in? Where do buses come in? We know what they do now, and we need to change that. Um, scheduling is something we're going to need to look at. And school bus requirements, and we need to make changes to the, to the routes, and is there a cost associated with that. So some of these committees, some of their work is obviously going to overlap. Some is looking at facilities, but obviously there's also a cost piece too. Pool use, we are proposing that we use the pool for physical education and that we consider using it for physical education for grades seven through 12. One of the STEM areas, in fact, if you're a student at Bridgewater State, you would know they actually have a department for physical education and health science, sciences. So even though our choice of terminology for program planning would focus on STEM. So within physical education and health sciences, we feel it's that here on Cape Cod, surrounded by water, we should have a goal of every student being water safe, every student a swimmer. And so we want to look at how we can accomplish that. We also have been talking about submersible robotics. We have a very good connection 
with uh, both Woods Hole and Mass Maritime. We believe that they will allow us to use equipment that's allowed, that is used during the summer uh, advanced student leadership program that is operated by our own Gil Newton, who is our science department chair at the high school. Uh, analysis and information gathering. We need to look at the current state of the mechanicals and the life expectancy in the pool. And a question that, I, that we need to answer, and I don't think it will take us long, but we need to find out, find out from uh, the MSBA if they would provide assistance uh, if the pool is considered an instructional space. If it's not used for kids, if it's not used for instruction, they will not help us with that. But for using it for physical education, submersible robotics, the question is, would they? We need to get an answer to that. Plan for common space use. We do know that we have a very good cafeteria, excellent library media center upstairs, abandoned coral rooms. We have an auditorium and theater facility that is really quite remarkable. Uh, the gymnasium, the pool, the athletic fields, there is a lot to this facility and we believe we can do a lot with it. Um, we need to look at a security plan upgrade. I have to tell you, since coming to Sandwich and working with J.J. Burke, who uh, really seems to be known by most everybody in town for the work he does on emergency services, and I have a regular monthly meeting with, I call it the Chiefs Meeting, it's with, uh, Police Chief, Fire Chief, Emergency Services. And we talk about what's going on with our kids, not just in school, but within the community. How can we help keep them safe? Because we care about them, not just when they're on school grounds, but when they're off of school grounds, down at the beach, how are they doing? And so we want to uh, stay aware of that. So we do a lot with security, a lot in the school that sometimes people don't even know about. But we have a security plan we want to update that because this I do know. There will be parents that will be concerned about, well, my seventh and eighth grader are going to be in that high school with those big kids. Well, I want to tell you, first of all, I have never met a more polite group of students than I encountered in this high school. That gives me great confidence all in itself. When you have a high school population this size, are you occasionally going to have some blip in terms of behavior? Sure you are. But they are few and far between. Frankly, they happen in our K-8 schools, too. That's kids learning and growing, and hopefully learning from their mistakes. But we will look at security. We want to assure parents the school within the school. I do believe, as was my experience in my last district, within a year, some parents will start to ask, is there any reason why my son or daughter, given their proclivity towards mathematics, science or world language. Is there a reason why they can't step outside the academy and actually take a high school course? The answer should be yes, because our goal should be to meet the academic needs of every single student. Athletics and activity programs, we know that under uh, Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Conference rules uh, that eighth grade students are eligible to participate in the high school interscholastic athletic program. We have an excellent program here. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't profess to know all of the talent that currently exists athletically within our K schools. Could an eighth grader uh, be on a freshman team, a JV team, a varsity team? Only time will tell. But sometimes they amaze me that, that at very young ages they're really quite talented and can have that kind of experience. We still will provide sports opportunities for all of the students who are not interested in being on an interscholastic team. Uh, when we talk about STEM program activities for students, that is across the whole system. While we talk 7th and 8th grade STEM, we have people talking about what's it going to look like in K-6, what's going to happen, <coughs> what's going to happen with the high school. We interestingly refer to it as a uh, a splash, uh, I'm sorry, a trickle down effect. So it trickled down and we have a splash up effect that occurs. And I know what will happen naturally into high school is high school departments will start to look and say, oh my goodness, look at the experience those kids are having. 
what does it mean for the way we do what we do? Is it always going to mean creating new courses? Not necessarily. It's more likely to mean we need to teach in ways that are different than the way we've been doing it for the last 50 years. And fortunately, education has already made some advancements because we recognize what happens in the world of work and research, not just in STEM-related areas, but in publishing you know, fields. How do people really work together? Uh, and again, uh, we will constantly make these STEM connections for kids. There can be other things, invention conventions, science fairs. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of traveling with uh, 30 of our students in our, uh, from two of our K buildings. Would have loved to have done third, but we, had, we were limited. Um, this was at a STEM expo this past spring at Bridgewater. And we were able to bring 30 students. Uh, we had 15 from Oak Ridge, 15 from Wing. Um, there'll be other opportunities for teachers and, and for students. But we went up there, and the place was packed. There were students from all over the state of Massachusetts, as well as teachers. And the kids actually filled out a feedback form. And I actually have a copy of those that were given to me. And if you wonder how kids respond to this kind of teaching and learning, I'll tell you, if you read those responses, it's very revealing. And these are not kids who necessarily are thinking, I want to go because I want to be a scientist or a tech involved in technology, engineer, or math. They just went and explored what was there, very hands-on um, career-based experiences for those kids. Um, in terms of pupil services, one of the things that we need to look at, and I want to assure people, is that we are going to be providing absolutely the same level of service that is there now. People think, oh gee, if we move seventh and eighth grade out, will they not have special education? Will they not have intervention programs? Uh, all of those have to be there because they're mandated by law. So we will be providing. And the interesting thing I find with special needs students, I had one parent asked me, is STEM meant to be an elite program? The answer is absolutely not. The research is really remarkable. If you take some students who struggle with learning in school, give them hands-on experiences, much more engaging. And some of these kids flourish even more in that kind of a program than in a more traditional model. So it's for everyone. Um, the Chinese, as a 21st century world language offering, uh, we welcome our Chinese teacher handout is now here living in Sandwich. We started her teaching here at the high school, and she is available the equivalent of one period a day at each of the K eights this year, just to give the, the kids a little bit of exposure to some of the cultural aspects and some introduction to the language in the hope of then uh, having them want to pursue that when they get up here for STEM and also for the uh, high school program. The art and science of visual and performing arts is what we're calling it, because it's not just about making pictures that hang on the fridge at home. We want kids to understand that there is a science, it's understanding of color theory, and perspective, and design. They're part of the visual arts, the performing arts. We also know that by increasing the size of the student population up here, while we're talking school within the school, when you are able to tap into a larger population, you have greater possibilities for bringing back your music programs here at the high school that were impacted by the decline in enrollment. And this year we have a new instrumental teacher who is like the Pied Piper. And he's excited, he's got great plans, and um, he just shared with me you know, some of the difficulties kids that want to do sports and band. And he said, well, would you want to do it in the morning before school at 7 o'clock? And the kid said, yes. So, you know, we believe the enthusiasm is there for the instrumental program, the choral program. We also were able to, uh, this year, bring uh, Belinda Lassett, and uh, she is, some of you may have seen our group, Sandwich Soul. Uh, they were connected with Forest Dale. Uh, they have come up to the high school. That will now be a part of the choral program here, and we hope to expand on it. They are so excited. 
the way the singing, the choreography occurs. I've actually had adults say, gee, would we actually think of an adult program? I'm saying, well, let's get this one going first. The same way I've had adults in the community ask if we would be offering Chinese. I said, let her get settled first, then eventually maybe we'll even offer Chinese through an adult ed program with the community school. And obviously, theater arts. We've got a great facility. We want to capitalize on that. We feel that all of these opportunities and enhancements should make this high school incredibly attractive as our hometown high school. Anticipated staffing, and I say anticipated because this is a work in progress. We know that we need to have a director for the STEM Academy, and we know we have people out there that are incredibly strong and have a lot of expertise in STEM curriculum, instruction, and professional development. We are going to look for, we will need a dean of students, 10 month position, because what I do know, I know seventh and eighth graders, I know them well, and I do know them well too. And so we know that, that they're going to need help, direction, support, and guidance. And that comes in two forms, one with the dean of students, and the other with a guidance council. Uh, we know that we're going to, because health sciences is a part of STEM, we want to have a health science teacher. And frankly, we should have had been teaching health long before this. This gives us the opportunity, at least with seventh and eighth grade, frankly, we're looking at ways in which we can introduce health, health topics right down into our lower grades. We'll be doing that somewhat through our curriculum mapping that we're doing, building some help science units into <coughs> science in the, in the lower grade. An engineering and design teacher. Uh, we also know that there will be robotics, but robotics is not all that goes into this. There are some excellent programs out there um, that have to do with engineering that are designed for use in middle school. Uh, some of them that are designed for even activities prior to middle school. So we're going to be looking at those to see how can we bring that here. But clearly, to be truly a STEM academy, we need to have engineering and design opportunities for our middle schoolers. And if you could have seen what I saw at that conference in Bridgewater with middle school kids doing design and engineering work through these various kits that they had, the question is, are the kids capable? You bet they are. We just have to provide the opportunity. So art, music, physical education, we have question marks. We're not sure what our staffing needs are there. Uh, if we are offering swimming, we're probably going to need someone who would be in the pool all day as the uh, aquatics teacher. Um, we're going to need to look at how that balances out. World languages. Uh, we have our current offerings. We have no plan to drop our current language offerings that are available to 7th and 8th graders. But we are looking to enhance it with the addition of Chinese. We're obviously going to need 8th grade teachers and 7th grade teachers that teach language arts and social studies, all those kinds of areas. But we need the same number. That's a process we need to go through. We need to do that analysis. It could be some shifting of roles. I also know some teachers have asked me, well, if I'm a 6th grade teacher but had taught 7th and 8th grade and I really want to be in that STEM academy, do I have any chance? And the answer needs to be yes. So what we're anticipating, once we have a director, is actually doing some one-to-one -one interviews. I want to be sure that the seventh and eighth grade teachers who will be part of STEM really want to be there. If not, we'll try and find an opportunity for them in a, in a setting that maybe is more um, accustomed to them. But the message for everyone needs to be teaching is changing, and it has needed to change for a long time. And if you read the research, as I do, um, it's overdue. And we are moving forward to make some significant changes in the way we teach throughout our entire district. Secretarial support, maintenance and security staffing adjustments, we'll want to take a look at that. So the program planning um, will involve administration, curriculum leaders, student representatives. I would like students to be involved in this process as well. We will be starting a uh, sandwich curriculum council. Uh, our first meeting is going to be the first Tuesday of October. 
it's a large group. I will tell you there will be two high school students, um, one senior, one junior. The junior will be on for two years, so we'll, and the, as we cycle through, we'll always have a student who serves for two years. And I have found from my experience the feedback from students about what that journey is like is critical to our planning program models. So we will involve student representatives and, and community members as well. We have people uh, in Sandwich. They may not think of themselves as teachers, but boy, they sure know a lot about the real world of work in STEM-related areas. And I expand that to go beyond just what you see as STEM. When I tell you that we will have uh, a couple students working directly with Mike Magyar on a project here. Uh, Mike has been a parent his kids came through the system. And uh, so we will be doing that kind of outreach to work with local artisans and uh, building those relationships. So there is, within this, a big piece is scheduling. And that's going to have to be uh, a, a very significant role for Dr. Boris uh, as principal of this overall facility. Um, I will tell you, let me just back up for a second. In order for eighth graders to be eligible for sports, there can only be one principal in the building. And that's one reason to have a director. But I will tell you from my experience, there's another good reason. Because I was in a system that created school within the school, initially with the thought of two principals, until there seemed to be a lot of debate as to who was really running the show. And so it's important that we have a very clear line of authority here, and that there will be one principal. So Dr. Boris will have oversight in terms of many things here. Certainly, we're going to see how the schedule will work. We're going to need input from our, our uh, K principals and our middle school teachers as well. We also know that there will be a lot of uh, planning for professional development, looking at priorities there. Uh, community outreach with uh, various facilities, I already mentioned, with school, Mass Maritime, um, a number of different groups, uh, Koi, Betty, Estuary Reserve. So I always pause on that one. <laughs> yeah. Someday I'll say it correctly. But I can tell you, I was uh, meeting with Gil Newton today, and Gil attended a meeting over there. They just received a major grant. And typical of Gil, he's now on the committee over there, too. Uh, so we're, we're building a lot of great connections. Um, higher education, I've met with the, both the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Four Cs, as well as the new president, uh, Dr. Dr. Cox. They want to help us in any way they can. We also know that we will be crossing the bridge and looking to build connections with higher education. Bridgewater is doing a lot in the area of STEM education. Uh, so we're going to look to uh, make those connections because it helps with grant opportunities for them and hopefully for us too. Uh, also a Speakers Bureau. I believe that if we are going to ask our community to support us, that we need to provide opportunities for our community to be involved in this too. And as I, I'm meeting often people that have uh, said, how can I help? I met a retired airline pilot uh, who said to me, doing anything in avionics, he's like, I can help with that. I said, great. He's got his name and phone number. So we're building that kind of uh, uh, group of people that we know we can turn to. So the effort of this committee today was to look at how can we form these three commit our committees. So I actually have a sign-in sheet or sheet of paper up here uh, for the committee members to ask who would like to sign on to one of these three committees? So I'd like you to be thinking about that. Um, I'm just going to continue for a moment to say that the structure that we want for these committees is to function with a framework. All research is driven by a common framework, or what some researchers refer to a lens, as a lens. How are we going to look at the issue, look at the problem? There are a variety of frameworks. This one just uses something that we tend to use in our curriculum design, which is that all of our units of study are driven by essential questions. And so um, this was just trying to be a little creative. So for facilities, the essential question in phase one, what is the best way to use the school to address program needs? 
very broad question. Focus questions, and these are just some samples that are shared and are in the handout. <coughs> the focus questions are questions that as we come up with those answers, they help guide us to the answer to the essential question. So that's the facilities, financial planning, what is the projected cost for STEM, and what savings can be realized through consolidation of programs to help mitigate the cost. And then there's some sample questions there. For the STEM program plan, how does STEM support and encourage 21st century skills across all disciplines at all grades? And then you'll, again, you'll see the, the focus questions down here. And you, this may not be all of them, but they're sample questions. What changes need to be made? How does STEM approach uh, enhanced language arts and the social studies? How does STEM approach enrich the visual and performing arts, professional development, um, what's the need, and what are the priorities? So these are some sample questions that that group can, can work with. I have indicated I will be involved with all three of those committees. But I've asked Alan Paul, in particular, to work with the facilities group, Michelle Austin, to work with the finance people, um, the, whatever information is needed to help uh, with projecting costs, we intend to provide. So that kind of finishes where I am. And again, the theme is we hope that everyone will support our hometown schools, in particular our hometown high school. And if we do that, uh, I realize parents still have the right to make choices and will. Um, it's just, again, my contention. I'm a parent. I'm going to make my choice best based on what I believe is the very best programming for my son and my daughter. And I intend to do my best, uh, along with all of you in this room and, and everybody else that's interested, to be sure that we present to this community an outstanding option at Sandwich High School in each of our other three schools, Forestdale, Oak Ridge, and